Assalamu alaikum guys, I'm going to just remove this brownie wrapper that I just ate from Assalamu alaikum guys, welcome I'm, I'm, I'm tired, we travelled, we just travelled, uh, Cream and I uh, We did like a 24 round, 24 hour round trip to Spain and We slept in two days, maybe like Eight hours in two days, which sounds like not that bad um, But it was like you know, four hours in one day, but it would be like two hours in the hotel, one hour on the plane and one hour, you know, on the sofa at home waiting to leave for the airport. And we had two days like that. So I don't think I slept more than three. The maximum amount of time I slept in one go was three hours. And so I did catch up on my sleep last night. Alhamdulillah, I had eight hours last night, which was strong. I went to sleep at 10 and I woke up at 6.45. That was good. But mm, I'm tired still. I'm, 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 I'm still trying to get back into the zone of work. You guys don't care. I'm just meant to be doing an intro here. Uh, listen, the tour is still on. It's still on. Freshly Grounded Tour is on. Uh, Manchester and London are the shows that we have next. Uh, Hamza Zortis and Ricky Nato are confirmed keynote speakers for both of those uh, dates, inshallah. So do go ahead and book your tickets at freshlygrounded.com forward slash tour. You do not want to miss it. It's a live event. It's a freshly grounded live event. These events are so much fun. You have a you have a great time. We have a great time. Everyone has a great time. And it's just a great time. Go ahead and book it. Freshlygrounded.com forward slash tour also i haven't actually pushed the game much recently but the game freshlygarden.com forward slash no shop.freshlygarden.com if you want to buy the game uh the game is a set of 100 conversation cards that helps you improve conversation and guess what we play it in this episode so it's really fun anyway let's get into the talk about the episode so this episode is with uh a brother called shazad shazad and i met uh during the mufti mank tour in december he was stage manager and also my roommate and um and I got food poisoning on the tour and he looked after me as well. So he kind of became my like carer as well. And uh, we had a really good time. And so I was like, hey, you should drop on an episode sometime. And he was like, hey, I would love to. And then we ended up making it finally happen. So this is a really cool episode of Shazad who also runs uh, Iman Relief uh, in some capacity, uh, which is an awesome charity. Check it out if you if you haven't. And uh, we speak a bit about the charity and then guys setting it up. We speak about teaching. Uh, we speak about uh, society and just a, a general chin wagon natter, really. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy this episode with Shehzad. And I will see you on the other side of this intro. And welcome to a freshly grounded, the brand new podcast. Well, it's not exactly brand new anymore, is it? Well, welcome to freshly grounded, the podcast. That's better. Created by best friends, Faisal and Sam. Huh? Welcome, I said, welcome to Freshly Grounded. After that bit. Created by... And after that bit. Best friends, Faisal and Sam. Really? Okay, so we are on. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Shazad and I met um, in the in the Iman channel, the Light Upon Light, sorry, tour. Uh, this past this year and um, it was really interesting because uh, we we kind of had a bit of a conversation didn't we at the beginning like in, at the Manchester Studios the, the day before the day yeah. we left left we were just like a general like you do with all the brothers Salam alaikum what do you do Aki? like no honestly oh yeah I've heard of you man relief and stuff like that. and then it became um, uh, as the tour went on we ended up becoming because we weren't originally uh, roommates and then we ended up becoming roommates uh, and then you basically became my uh, my like uh uh, my carer on the tour. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there was uh, a lot of blessings during that trip yeah. itself, and Hamdulillah, it was uh, nice to actually get put in a room with you. Alhamdulillah. Um, but yeah, it was it was an interesting experience. Face on, very interesting experience. So uh, I'll give context now so how, how that all ended up transpiring. So um, I I literally I think I said in a podcast before the tour, like I hope I don't get food poisoning this tour because. Uh, last tour I got food poisoning and it was like but it was 24 hours so alhamdulillah 24 hour food poisoning and it was just really bad the Glasgow show was really bad and then after that everything was good so this time I got food poisoning and not only that but it lasted five weeks guys it was really 
like just had to cancel so many meetings for a few weeks and I was just like trying to get myself back and it, I was, it was even a struggle getting the episodes out and stuff like that. I it, it was really bad. I was constantly at the doctors. I won't go into the gruesome details, but it, it happened on the tour again and it happened on like the, literally the first or second yeah, night. Yeah, very, very early on. And, uh, and you basically, Shazad, showed me so much love and you were like really looking after me and I felt, do you know what it is, bro? I felt like such a, uh, uh, what is it called? A hypochondriac because it was the last tour that this exact same thing happened. So I was thinking these guys must think, oh my gosh, like we're never going to book Fraser again. Like this guy is just every, like always like hypochondriac. Yeah. And I, so I was trying really hard to not be like that, but I, just, I physically was just, I couldn't eat, I couldn't do nothing. And you, Marshall, probably because you weren't on the last tour, you showed me the most sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then um, obviously there was a worry, like, uh, like was it COVID? And alhamdulillah, it wasn't COVID. Uh, but you um, you were like, bro, look, I've had COVID already recently. Like, why don't you get like stay with me just in case anything ends up happening like I'll be alright so that was very kind of you and then we ended up becoming roommates and then um, yeah you just looked after me really well and I really yeah, appreciate no, it, it was uh, it was it was a nice opportunity you see Faisal in life you're going to meet people at different stages you're going to meet people going through different things and generally the, the love, attention, care that you can give to people is what lasts and what stays with them so for me it was a really easy opportunity it was okay you know Faisal's a little bit unwell we all get unwell we know how we feel when, when we're unwell and these type of things a little bit of extra love, a little bit of attention doesn't do anything. It, it doesn't make my life any more difficult than, than it already is. And, it, and it's generally an easy thing to do. So it was a nice opportunity. Beyond that, it was nice on my part to see you in a, in a position where even with you being unwell or it being a difficult thing that I could see you as pushing through. I could see that, no, I want to be here. I want to give this conference or this tour that the best of me. Um, and that in itself, you know, I, I could relate to. I could relate to that, okay, you know, it's not the best circumstance. It's not the best situation, but he's still putting in the graft. So for me, if, it's, if I can encourage him a little bit, or if I can give him a little bit of words here and there, why not? He's already doing 90% of the work. It's just pushing in that additional 10%. So it was a nice opportunity. Yeah, I, well, it makes me, that, that it makes, you know, I, I always say to people that my, I, I, amongst, everything my my favorite thing one of my favorite things about islam as well as everything else about islam is that is the brotherhood and the not only the brotherhood but the focus that islam puts on brotherhood and then the implementation that the brothers put on it because essentially the I wasn't adding any benefit to your life in a dunya sense yeah if anything I was adding more stress but from a but but I from an akhirah sense, when you're helping out a brother for the sake of Allah, um, you are getting something because Allah is most just. And I think that's beautiful. And I really felt that love. And I really appreciate that, bro. You looked after me. And what was actually really helpful as well is that um, your role on the tour was stage manager. Yeah. And so you were the one who controlled everyone's timing on the stage and getting me ready. And so it was lovely that the guy who was looking after me also was managing the stage because I'm on the show the whole eight hours or yeah. however long the show is because I'm hosting it. And so anytime I kind of needed a bit of extra time or I needed... Um, some more time off stage or anything, you were really helpful like managing that, and so that was that was also really. Alhamdulillah, good. It was it was a good opportunity for me? It was the first time that I've managed this stage, yeah. um, and it was the first time you're really good at in, in a long time. Oh, yeah. It's the first time in a very long time that I've been in the Dawah scene within that parameter. So I lived away for a number of, number of years, and I've only been back for a few. So just having that opportunity of doing that, being around the brothers. It was a really nice experience for me and I'm grateful to Iman Channel and Light Upon Light that they allowed me to sort of be part of it. And then sort of, as you're saying, the brotherhood of it. You know, every day there's 10, 12 of us living in the same hotel, spending time together, laughing, joking, some of us unwell, yeah. all of this type of stuff. So it, it's nice, that, that type of brotherhood. And you, you tend to get that when you're at university. Yeah. So you might get that when you're at uni or you're living away and this type of stuff. You sort of have that within your eye socks. And then you sort of go away and the real world happens so. and you don't really have that time. So for that sort of six, seven days to just have that, it's just us, the families where they are. And yes, we talk to them and, and make sure they're fine. But beyond that, it's just us to enjoy that period of time. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's very interesting. Really in, in hindsight, I enjoyed it a lot as well. Yeah. But in hindsight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. Actually, you know, when we were on the tour, we got to see like loads of different. We we saw thousands of people. I think I counted. Well, I didn't count each individual one, but like on estimate, we there was around ten thousand different people we were in front of. On yeah, that, maybe on that show, more, right? maybe even more. Yeah, potentially more. And um, you get to see different communities and how they are, and and um, you know. Uh, you you end up building a picture that oh we're going to Manchester next that crowd is a bit more like this mm -hmm. uh, we're going to um, you know Leicester that crowd is a bit more like this. and so I want to like 
zoom out right and ask you a question especially with like your work in charity and uh you've always been around with teaching and stuff like that you've always kind of been around people and observing people mm -hmm. um would you say i find that people tend to have like one uh, key part of like society so like a societal um issue that they are passionate about mm -hmm. uh it could be crime it could be uh helping people uh, that have um uh, issues with mental health and stuff like that is there like a societal issue um that holistically so regardless of like religion i guess that you see and you're passionate about in general um it's kind of putting you on the spot yeah no i, I think that's that's quite a good question but i think it's a really deep question mm -hmm. um i think empowerment uh with all context, whether empowerment for women, whether empowerment for children, whether empowerment for people who have sort of feel that they're deprived and have been oppressed and going through difficulties. I think empowerment itself uh, is something that's very, very important within societies, within all elements and within sort of all levels of society itself. So I think empowerment is something that I'm extremely passionate about, that I feel it's important to give people the skills and empower them to be able to take control of their lives again. Um, and I think that that sort of why I went into teaching and went into education to begin with. And that's sort of been the crossroad into the charity sector as well at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I think that the idea of people helping people become the best version of themselves is, uh, which essentially is empowerment, is one of the best things you can give somebody. Uh, and especially if you feel like you see someone who is lacking in confidence, if you can somehow inspire somebody and give them the gift of confidence, then all of a sudden that becomes an independent person. It's like that saying that you can teach them how to fish and so on and so forth, right? And um, yeah, I, I, I love that because of that whole feeling of knowing that somebody can stand on their own two feet and sometimes somebody needs a push to do that, but everybody has the ability to do yeah, it. Yeah, really. there's a great satisfaction in that. And generally, if, if we look at teachers, regardless to what level, whether they teach at primary school, secondary school, universities, colleges, teachers generally get that satisfaction of seeing their students develop, of seeing their students, you know, be able to, to do particular tasks and do particular things. And that from an educational standpoint or from a school standpoint is great. It's fantastic. OK, you know, we're giving them the, the skills that they need to be able to access life and, and to be able to do well in life. But then when it comes out of that and you actually empower people to take control of their lives and build themselves, that again has a great satisfaction in it. So it's almost a selfish thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost a selfish thing on our own parts that we like the satisfaction of that. Um, but you see how life changing it is for people. You can see it in their eyes. You can actually see it in their eyes when you take someone from a stage where they were in desperation and couldn't do anything for themselves, but now you put them in a position where through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through whatever skill set that you have that you've been able to support them with, that you've given them that glimmer of hope back in their eyes and they, they're sort of shining again, that they can actually take control and, and do things with themselves. Uh, again, if we relate back to the beauty of Islam as well, the, one of the m most lovely things about that is often if you're trying to empower somebody or encourage somebody, uh, you'll often find that people will only empower and encourage somebody until they, if it will, uh, as long as they're not a threat to that to, mm -hmm. to, to them, mm -hmm. right? As soon as it's like, okay, you're a threat to me, I will stop encouraging you, stop empowering you, because now you're uh, now you might be taking opportunities away from me, mm -hmm. and that's what the that that's what's so beautiful about Islam, because when you can accept this concept of qadr and that only what will is meant for me will reach me then you no longer have that limit yeah i can uh, you'll no longer just help somebody until they're a threat to you you'll help somebody even if they're above you you'll help somebody even if you th feel like they're in your field because what is meant for you will reach you when i read that it was on instagram 10 years ago or something and when i just read this like i was following so many of these Arabic uh, or like these like poetic Instagram pages that are just like white background and black text. I tried to do that and it's I realized so that I was terrible at it. I, I'd done that for about, I lived in Saudi at the time and I'd done that for about a week. Oh really? Yeah, and I showed that, and I only had it up on my statuses. I didn't even have, have an Instagram. Um, had it up on, and the, the guys were like, you're terrible at this bro, the, just leave this alone. And I was like, all right, fine, I left it alone. I was just really bad at it, but I know what type of uh, pages you're so talking good. about. And I saw the one that I, one of the ones I saw was, it was like Arabic proverb. Comma, uh, colon and it said uh, what is meant for you will reach you even if it's between two mountains and what is not meant for you will not reach you even if it's between your two lips yeah and I was like wow man I'm gonna remember that forever and I did <laughs> you know the Amazing embodiment bit. of that you know uh, Faisal for for me the embodiment of that is yourself in terms of the course that you're doing now 
in terms of the course that you're actually running with regards to how people can set up podcasts, how they can monetize, how they can actually develop their own platforms. So that in itself for me is an embodiment of you understanding that even if I develop other people, even if I give them the skill set and the know-how, what is meant to be will be for me and what is meant to be for them, Allah will give to them. Why? Because Allah's bounty is so wide that Allah can give to you and give to others with, with no issue. So I think that that embodiment of Qadr and what's going to be mine is seen in that action of yours to, to set up that course itself. Well, that's very kind of you, but there is, there's like a lot of selfish benefit I can get from that, it's like, especially because I'm charging for the course. No, it's of course, a- absolutely. But still at the same time, even with people who charge for courses and these type of things, yes, there is the selfish benefit of you know monetizing and what they can get from it. But that skill set itself sometimes of just teaching people and developing people itself, at the end of it, there is going to be an element in your mind where you think on a human perspective that if I'm teaching and I'm developing people to such a stage, at some point, are they going to become competitors? Correct, it's yeah, just human guess, to, to yeah. think like that. And the fact that you push through that and put that to aside to say, okay, I'm going to monetize, I'm going to make some money from it, no problem at all, but I'm also going to give someone a skill set, inshallah, that they can develop, feed their families or do what they need to, allows you to push that to the back of your, your thought process. So it still works. You still have that element of, you know, what's mine is mine and what's yours is going to come to you. Yeah, the, the, Islam really does like fix all like parts of like personalities and stuff, doesn't it? Especially if like practiced properly, like Sheikh Tim was saying in last week's episode. Um, you you mentioned the, 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 the kind of background of a teacher. So uh, let's talk about that. When did you start teaching? Where were you teaching? How was kind of the beginning of, I suppose like the, where this whole story culminates is the launch of Iman Relief, which is a very young charity, which I was surprised about because I felt like I'd heard of it so yeah. much. Um, but Iman Relief is kind of where you're at now. Yeah, Iman Relief now is one year old. This, wow. this February was one year itself. That we've officially been an official charity for one year. Do you, do you sit back and reflect on how much has progress? Has we we actually done that last night, and because uh, we we have our our group meetings on a Wednesday, and we we sat back and we had a discussion of what the vision was at the beginning itself, and what we thought we would achieve, and where it is now, and we're dumbfounded. Yes, yeah, amazing. We, we're absolutely dumbfounded by Allah's mercy and Allah's bounty. That he that he gave to us uh, in the work that we do, and inshallah, we'll we'll talk about that more in in, in greater depth. But uh, so, what was the story? So, uh, how you st- initially it starts with you teaching. So, uh, where were you teaching? Okay, you so teaching? with me, sort of going back to two thousand eight, two thousand eight nine. I always had this this notion in my mind of I want to go away and I want to live in the Muslim lands. And that was always always a thing for me. So I remember back in 2008, uh, I got married and me and my wife went abroad and, and we lived in Egypt uh, for a period of time. And, and that was wonderful. Um, however, of course, being young and naive, I thought 3,000 pounds was enough to make hijrah. Three. Either, yeah, yeah, 3,000. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was a young man at that <laughs> yeah. point. And, uh, and I thought I, I understood the world. I understood everything as it is. And, and now I look back and I find that quite amusing. Um, but we, we left, we, we took the money, we left and, and we went to Egypt and we lasted about six months. Um, and then I, I sort of told my dad that I was like, I need some money. And he was like, yeah, I think you need to come back and work. So I was like, fair dues, did it? So, so I came back type of thing. Um, thereafter, there was always this notion in my mind of I want to live abroad, I want to live abroad, I want to live abroad. Um, and what was the easiest way to do it? So I saw a few of my friends at, at the time, they had gone and done a CELTA teaching course and they had sort of done a degree and they were teaching abroad in Saudi Arabia and, and these type of things. So back, I think, 2011, um, I'd done a teaching course uh, to be able to teach English to adults. And then after that, I realized, okay, a teaching course by itself wasn't enough because I hadn't been to university at that point. I'd done a year at university, you know, 2008, eight, nine, and then I left uh, university at that point because I just didn't enjoy the course I was doing. I was doing a course in... Uh, economics and accounting and it just didn't work for me so I sort of left and then come sort of 2012 I went back to university at this point I was married I had children um, and my wife was always very very supportive you know with regards to education or with regards to wanting to sort of get out and not live in the UK type of thing so I went back to university I'd done a degree in education uh, Walillah alhamdulillah I got first class on his degree completed that and then I moved on directly to a master's uh, I then done a master's in English language teaching Wow. and then 2015 I I went to Saudi Arabia. Amazing. So I went to Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah, 2013, took, uh, spent three years out in Saudi Arabia, finished in Saudi, and then I moved to Oman. Spent a year in Oman as well, and then came back to the UK 
um, after that point. Since coming back, I've, I've started my PhD. Um, I'm three years into the PhD. Oh, I've man. got a year left. And and okay, fine. I was going to ask how long is a PhD? And what is the PhD in? Education. Wow. Yeah, so it's all pretty much been uh, education centered. So I'm just completing the PhD now, inshallah ta'ala. And then once that's sort of completed, then there is, uh, you know, another idea of sort of possibly moving back out to the Middle East and, and these type of things. So with regards to Iman Relief um, and sort of education and, and how it sort of came came around, when I was living in Saudi Arabia, um, I was teaching at a university in Saudi Arabia which had the biggest English language program in the world. So we were around 15,000 students, wow. um, over 700 teachers across four campuses. Now, the main campus where I was, there was over 400 teachers, three to 400 teachers, give or take. So with that being said, when I sort of moved into that campus itself, there was all these different groups of brothers. Now, we're all <coughs> Westerners. Some of us are Australians, Americans, Brits. But you've got these uh, offices where there's about 20 people in an office type of thing. So you sort of go and find an office where you sort of feel comfortable. So you've got different people from different walks of life and these type of things. And I ended up in an office um, with you know, all of the, the brothers who now are sort of the trustees for Iman Relief itself. So we sort of ended up in that office. And at that point, when you live out in Saudi Arabia, initially, when you're sort of haven't bought your family yet, you share houses. So you sort of rent an apartment together, two, three of you rent a house together, everyone's got their room type of thing. And almost that university vibe again. So at that point, we were sort of just teaching, just teaching in Saudi Arabia. And from time to time within the office, one of the brothers would say, okay, let's get some money together. Let's build a well somewhere. Or let's get some money together, let's build a masjid. Or let's get some money together, let's do this or let's do that type of thing. So there was always, you know, within that group of brothers, Allah Mubarak, there was always a notion to want to do something, uh, some sort of charitable efforts. So we done that for a, we done that for a while. The brothers, mashallah, you know, we'd raised some money, built, uh, I think we built a masjid in India. We built one in Somalia at the time. Um, and that was sort of just, you know, a collective group of teachers, uh, you know, from within that office. And we would ask other teachers as well, because alhamdulillah, when you're out there, you're earning good money. You know, it's not too difficult for someone to come and say to you, okay, bro, do you want to join the project type of thing? You know, give a hundred pound towards it type of thing. So we sort of done that. And we've done that for a while. And while you lived sort of in Saudi Arabia as well, um, whenever we had holidays, the brothers would travel together. So we'd done the, the road trips going up to Mecca, Medina, and visiting the whole of Saudi Arabia in different cities. But we'd also travel to other countries. So, you know, visit Turkey, visit um, Malaysia, visit uh, Tanzania, Zanzibar, these different locations. So with that being said, at one point, a group of us decided that we want to go for a safari. So we said, let's go to Zanzibar. We'll do a five-day safari and then we'll go to, sorry, let's go to Tanzania. We'll do a five-day safari and then after that we'll go to Zanzibar and spend sort of a week, a week and a half in Zanzibar just relaxing on the beach type of thing. So there was a group of us, six, seven of us who sort of got up, booked flights and, and we went. Once we got there, the first five days, lots of fun. We're, we're looking at animals, you know, we're, we're in the safari, we're sort of camping out um, and even camping out, camping in the Serengeti. Um, where you know there's hyenas and lions and these type of things and, and you've got the stars above you, amazing Absol In terms of brotherhood and bonding One of the, the best experiences of my life wow. So we sort of completed that And we went to Zanzibar And now there's a group of six of us Sitting on the beach every day And it was like, alright boys I can sit on the beach for a couple of days But is there nothing else we can do with our time? So one of the brothers who was there He said, why don't we look for an orphanage? Why don't we look for an orphanage and we'll go and we'll teach for a day. We're all teachers. We'll go and teach for a day at an orphanage um, as sort of just something nice that we can do for the, the orphans and at the same time a nice experience for us. So we considered that. We considered that and I actually, you know, we got on the phone to a friend of mine um, who's been working in the charity sector for a number of years, well over a decade. I sort of contacted him and said to him, okay, do you have any orphanages um, in Zanzibar that we could sort of visit? Uh, we want to sort of go and teach and, and these type of things. And he said to me, I've got a couple. I can give you some contact details and these type of things. But why don't you consider, you know, doing something else for them other than teaching them? Because if you teach them, okay, you've benefited them for a day. However, if you decide to sort of possibly raise some funds for them or do something else, you know, it might last them a little bit longer. So we had a discussion amongst the brothers. And, and after having that discussion, we sort of decided, okay, why don't we go to the orphanage and assess their needs? And this is a very natural thing, just a group of lads on holiday together. Let's go to an orphanage, have a look at it and sort of see, you know, what we could do for them. So we went to the first orphanage uh, and we sort of saw, OK, that they need uniforms. They need school supplies. They need uniforms. They need coal to be able to cook. They need rice, sugar, flour, food, all of that type of stuff for the next sort of six months. So we looked at the first one and we were like, 
okay, what does that roughly cost? And we went to the market. So now if you just imagine a group of uh, Brits. Very ad hoc. Yeah, sort of just, we've gone to the market. We're sort of looking at what does that sort of cost? We've put a price list together and we're like, all right, let's phone our, our friends and family. No charity page, no collection or nothing. We made some calls. Bro, send me some money. You know, mom, can I have some money? Or, you know, brothers are asking their, their siblings, their family, their friends, whatever. And at the end of it, alhamdulillah, we raised, you know, a reasonable amount of money. But we raised more than what we needed for just one orphanage. So then we said, okay, we've got more than what we need. Let's go and look at a second orphanage. So at that time, we actually ended up looking at two orphanages, done a needs analysis for both of them. Um, and we sort of went and we distributed the aid ourselves. We, we rented a, a van uh, or a truck type of thing. We had a driver or whatever. And we went to the markets, bought all of the items ourselves, went, distributed it, met the children, met the people who are running the orphanage and, and this type of stuff. So that was sort of the initial... Okay, we're on the ground, we're doing something type of thing. There was no name, there was, it was just a group of, of friends together doing that. So we'd done that, and that was sort of 2019, the summer of 2019. There these after, times you're still teaching? Yeah, you? yeah, these times we're still teaching. I think at this point I've come back, and I've just joined the boys for a trip. Okay. Uh, so at this point I'm, I'm already back, I believe. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm really bad with dates. 19, 2019, I'm already back here. So thereafter, we've said, okay, fine, we've done that. Mashallah, well done, boys. Good job. Everyone's had a good holiday. Go back to work. So everyone went back to their lives, went back to work. I came back here. A few of the brothers went back to Saudi or whatever. Ramadan comes. So Ramadan comes. And at this point, we're thinking, okay, you know, we, we helped two orphanages last year in Tanzania. We've got one of the brothers who is actually the, the founder of the organization. Uh, he himself is Tanzanian, so he's got family who live in Tanzania. His, his father actually passed away uh, recently. We ask Allah to have mercy on his I mean, father and I mean, to grant him Jannah. I mean. um, so he sort of brought us together and he was like, okay, last time we done it for two orphanages, why don't we do food packs? Did you know, sorry, I want to put you in there, that a fact I found out yesterday is that the oldest tree in the world is in Tanzania. Amazing. Amazing. 6,000 years old tree. SubhanAllah. I could be wrong with that information, but I think... We'll, I read that we'll, we'll do a fact check. Yeah, if someone can <laughs> fact check that for me and put it in the comments, but I believe that's true. Yeah, so we... we um, Ramadan came and we said, okay, let's uh, let's fundraise. Right. So we fundraised. Alhamdulillah, first time as a group, collectively, he put all of us together. We fundraised. And at this point, we raised enough to support, uh, to support six orphanages. Ramadan. So we supported six orphanages. I think it was... You know, maybe about 450 food packs or something. Very, very small in, in the charity sector. But for us, it was a huge, a huge uh, achievement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to be able to help, you know, the better part of 450 families. You know, that, that's an amazing, amazing achievement for us at that point. And then for the rest of Ramadan, brothers just went away and continued doing what we were doing. So with that, some of us were fundraising for other organizations because we weren't an organization. We were of just course. a group of brothers on a WhatsApp group. So, you know, some of the brothers went and fundraised for other charities and other things. And then sort of Ramadan ended. Um, and then the same brother sort of, we, we sat down and we looked at it and we said, okay, across this group of brothers within this Ramadan itself, if we look at everywhere where the brothers have fundraised or whatever, mashallah, the brothers, we've, we've raised a substantial amount of money that we could possibly, you know, be able to benefit the, the, the people ourselves with. Um, and then we had a discussion on, okay, should we formalize this process? Should we become a charity? And that went on for quite some time. So we, we ended up taking workshops from someone who's worked in the sector for a long time. Uh, he sort of directed us. We took workshops. We, we went through, okay, what type of an organization would we want to be? Uh, what type of work would we want to do? Uh, can we do it with our schedules and what we do and all the rest of it? Can we not do it? So it was a really, with, with teachers, it's always a really formal process. It's like, okay, everyone sort of got their SWOT analysis is going on and, yeah, and you know, yeah. you're sort of looking at yes or no, with your do's and your don'ts and what you can and what you can't. And then at the end, the brother said, yeah, let's, let's do it. And uh, up to now, you know, I'm extremely grateful to the brother Walid, who was the founder of Iman Relief uh, himself and for the fact that he's put all of the, the brothers together. And uh, at that point, we then decided, okay, let's register as a not-for-profit organization. So we went through, okay, we went through names and we went through logos and all of that type of stuff and registered as a not-for-profit. So we registered as a not-for-profit sort of around June, July, um, June, July 2020. We then put in an application to the Charity Commission November. Then the following February, so 2021, they gave us our charitable status. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And then since then, we've, uh, we've just been working. And now, walillah, alhamdulillah, you know, we've, uh, we've worked in, I think yesterday, the count was 19 countries. 
Uh, we worked in 19 countries over the last year. Uh, That's just shocking in one year. That's amazing. It's for us, even when we look at it, like we've done our annual report uh, in December just to sort of put together everything that we've done over the last year. And we are extremely grateful. We are extremely grateful to Allah that He chose a group of us to be able to do this work. And we're humbled. We're, we're humbled that we are, you know, doing this work itself. I know that the charity itself uh, distributes, uh, has, has, has lots of work that it does mm -hmm. in. Um, uh, in, in all of these different countries But how, what support does The uh, Charity need Or how can uh, people help the charity So that the charity can carry on doing those things Is that a thing that exists? Yeah absolutely so I think something that's really really important For us is volunteers Okay. I think volunteers in a number of different ways Are very very important so for instance uh, This winter we ran a big winter Campaign for the Syrian refugees Syrian and Palestinian refugees living in Lebanon Living in camps and tents and this type of stuff um, So we ran a big campaign For that and we had two deployments So we actually had people who volunteered to come out on deployment Itself so that was something that's really 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 unique and really not unique to us but for us as an opportunity to be able to give to other people it was a unique opportunity for us to provide that to someone because that was the first time that we were taking people who are not part of the board uh, itself to say okay you can come out on deployment come and distribute your own money in terms of what you've fundraised for and distribute your own items so deployment is one way that people can always support you know whenever you see an ad to sort of say or whenever you see some sort of marketing to say we're going on a deployment you know, come forward to, to want to come on deployment with us as well and to be able to distribute the aid. So that's number one. Number two, in terms of volunteers here in the UK itself. So we are looking at building a, a volunteer bank of people um, who can sort of help us with fundraising, who can sort of help us with events that we want to put on in the future as well. So we are looking at doing sort of the Snowdonia challenges and, and these type of things that other organizations do as well. We're looking to have sort of our annual dinners and all of these different things. So we are slowly progressing and growing into that stage. And we want to build a strong volunteer bank uh, of people who can sort of support with that. If I can throw my two pence in, which of course. is my completely unexperienced two pence in this no, no, sector, go ahead. so please ignore, uh, completely ignore this if you, uh, if you feel to do so. But, <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, in, in anything, really what people are looking for in any sector is innovation, isn't it? Yes. Because innovation really is key. <clears throat> and I think that there's like always meant, there's always should be this like perfect balance, which is really hard to find, of doing the things that um, clearly uh, have a uh, a good hit rate at working and that, uh, that you know precedent has shown that this works and so those things are if we're talking about volunteers for example are obviously things like having volunteers come to deployments having volunteers in the uk that can help with fundraising but i think where <clears throat> and, and, and i think it's amazing that even you guys are doing that and i but i think where the other side of it is where we can get that balance with st stuff like humanity, I'm sure you guys are doing this. Is I I don't see many charities outwardly outwardly or like uh, really overtly pushing for creative uh, uh, um, volunteers volunteers yeah. who are creatives and so uh, people who may not be able to help in uh, deployments may not be able to help in fundraising naturally because a lot of creatives are real introverts real people who perhaps don't feel comfortable stepping out and and, and physically going somewhere or, or 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 don't feel comfortable saying hey guys i'm raising money for this but they have skills that five years down the line may benefit you more than somebody who can go out and raise 100k no absolutely i, I think you make a really really good point there i think filmmakers the, developers absolutely um, graphic designers uh, social media experts uh, advertising experts I, I, these guys people who are really knowledgeable about like like uh, the whole um, uh, uh, blockchain stuff right now, you know, those kind of things. Oh, yeah, depending upon if blockchain is permissible, because that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. But yeah, I think you make a really, really good point. And I think with us now, what we've what we've really looked at over the last year, for us, it was always a thing of processes. Processes and policies, processes and policies, processes and policies. Who are we using in what country? What partners do we have on the ground? Who's implementing for us? Are we completely confident and comfortable with what we're doing, where we're doing it? So with us, the last year, we didn't actually look at media or marketing. Maybe we, we gave it 10% gave it of our actual time because in our mind, 
there was no need for us to go away and collect a million pounds. Sure. But we can't distribute that in accordance to how we want to distribute it with our policies and our sure. processes. Yeah. So with us, we spent the last year making sure our policies and processes were in place where today, alhamdulillah, if someone comes and donates a million pounds, we can actually manage that yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we spent the last year sort of doing that. However, sort That's of in the last couple of, since January onwards, or, or really since December onwards, we have had this push towards the media marketing element of it. Because now when we look at the charity sector itself and we look at media marketing, for me, media marketing is, is half of the process. Right. It's at least half of the process. Yeah. Of course, the management of the funds and actually being able to implement and distribute in accordance to you know the way that we want to is, is fundamental, vital. But beyond that, actually getting the stories of the people out, yeah. raising awareness, yeah. allowing people to actually be educated and understand the realities of our brothers and sisters across the world is absolutely fundamental. It's the second half of the process. So with us now, we're looking at that. With us now, we've, you know, we've just bought in someone who takes care of our Instagram. We've just bought in someone who now, you know, does some of our graphic design work, and you know, we're, we're trying to internalize it and bring it internal instead of always, you know, sort of sending it out for external people to be able to do it for us. So we are in need of, you know, graphic designers. We are in need of filmmakers. We are in need of, you know, people who create content and these type of things. Why? Because the content element of it is what allows people to be educated. 100%. And, and I think without that, we can't get the voices out. So I think it's really, really important for us, anyone who sort of wants to volunteer within that remit of being a creative, within that remit of actually, okay, I can graphic design for you or I can sort of create content videos, pictures, whatever. I can do all of this type of stuff. That now is the stage that we're sort of heading towards and the direction that we need to go in. So we're, we're open to people volunteering and, and giving us their support in, in that regard as well. We will move on from the discussion of, of, of charity, but before we do, uh, I, I love what you said about making sure that your fundamentals are straight because, uh, and that's what I also love about Spot, because you know there was so many times when Spot, uh, were, people would say, I want to donate money in the early days of Spot. And a um, worker would say, um, right now we don't need it not that like there's no need for it mm -hmm. but we work on this project right now we've got the funds for it when we're on to the next project we'll tell you now alhamdulillah spot has moved on into a situation where now the system is in place like you said where if people don't get money there's there is a, there's a system right mm -hmm. and i love that about what you said about your man relief because it's so important and it reminds me of this thing that this so there's this finance guy in america called ramit Sethi. i don't know if you've heard of him mm -hmm. and um you know, not everything. Well, he has a different opinions on different things, right? Some controversial, and some, I, 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 some I think are great, and others, perhaps, I don't necessarily go with. But one of the things is that he, I believe it's Ramit who said this. He said that everybody should have a money system, mm -hmm. and even if we look at the, and he was talking about personalized, but as an organization, it works great as well. And he said that if I gave you ten thousand pound today, um, w where would you spend it? And he asked this question to people, I believe, and people would say, you know, a car or a holiday and so on and so forth. And the correct answer, according to Rami, is that it goes into my money system. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you don't have a money system, that's the first problem because you should have a system where it goes, okay, someone's giving me 10,000 pounds and it just falls. The 10,000 pounds falls into like this system of money where it goes, oh, okay, so that means that um, X amount goes into here and X amount goes into here and X amount goes into here. And, and, it, and so you're now at the service of your system. You don't have this uh, ability to become erratic with that money. And so it sounds like you guys created a system um, uh, and that's obviously fundamental. And I think part of that, the, the reason that we were able to, to do that was because from the onset, we had advice from someone who had been in the sector for the last oh, that's great. decade, maybe that's great. 15 years, give or take. So when we sat with him and we went through all of these workshops, and even up to now, he still is an advisor on our, on our board. Um, so when we have any big decisions that we need to understand the sector more for, sure. we go to him and, and we sort of take advice from him. He was able to, to teach us those things. And being teachers ourselves, Generally, we teachers know how to learn. Right. So we were receptive to, okay, sure. that's what he's sort of advising us and that's what he's saying, but we need to go and read around it and we'll go and read and we'll sort of do our own research at the same time to sort of, you know, say, okay, yeah, we're comfortable with what you're saying because of everything else that we've read in the process. So with us, it was really, really important that systems need to work. Oh, systems are so fundamental, bro. And, and then even if we talk about this uh, this creative thing about um, having creative uh, volunteers or really actually actively pushing for those creative volunteers, I think like what you would find if you become like so solely focused on that, which I, I recommend, uh, I think what you find is that everybody around you saying like, why are you doing that? It's crazy. Like it doesn't make any sense, right? And um, 
uh, I'll give a football analogy here, which I'm going to do a really bad job at because I don't know it very well. I don't know how much you know of football. Are you uh, uh, in, enough to sort of watch, but not enough to sort it, of tell you who's on the analogy. table? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to give a really bad analogy here, okay, and I might be completely wrong with it. But there's this guy called Mikel Arteta, who's the manager of Arsenal, and I believe at the beginning of like this season and stuff when Arsenal weren't doing so great everyone was like this guy needs to be fired yeah. and I think today the news came out that actually in the summer they're going to like offer him like a better contract right because now his plan is coming to to, to fruition and I believe he had this plan with that like he's going to invest in young players to build like the next generation of mm-hmm. the team and so there was all these young players coming on um, and they were not doing great because they were inexperienced and started losing big matches and now they've got, got some experience, everyone's like, oh, wow, this guy's plan worked. Yeah. But at the beginning, everyone was like, you're crazy, you need to be fired. And so I think you have to go through that phase of you're crazy, you need to be fired. And then you end up becoming like great through that. And uh, and I do think that there's a big negligence on, look, creativity is the, is the next phase, right? Like there's these guys like Dean developers, for example, who are, who are like... Muslims focusing on development mm-hmm. and like creating like I believe they even do like you know what, like hackathons and stuff like that yeah. I'm not entirely sure if they are but I think from the stuff I've read on Twitter it seems like they are all of these things are so big and for big organisations or like sectors like charity should be looking at those things and going these guys are great how can and, and they're Muslims which means that they want to also do good and we can benefit from great developers because a great developer means that if that if, if that developer wants to do something charitable a great developer could mean that he could contribute towards creating a function on your website that allows people to uh, donate with um you know uh, in an easier manner right? Mm-hmm. donate with face ID for example yeah. and that will enable 10,000 people now to donate faster and that's something that um Perhaps other people come I, I think it's, I think it's really really important they excite me no I, th- I think it's really really important with that we actually uh we looked at possibly accepting cryptocurrency as donation yeah. recently. We're currently well, looking at yeah. We're currently looking at the legalities around it. Okay. Um, just because obviously as crypto you can donate anonymously. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there isn't a traceable yeah. trail of, of where that money's come from. So we're looking at the legalities, and it may be possible. It may be that we're you know five years ahead of the curve right now, and we need to sort of slow down and wait. But the, these are the, these little bits of innovation are very very important. But beyond that, what I think is really really important is, is this thing with with creatives. Um, the the brother now who runs our Instagram and does you know pretty much all of our graphic design work and our videography work, he himself you know previously worked within. He worked within the, the sector of being a creative and these type of things, but it was always for businesses, shops, clothing brands and these type of things. However, we were the first charity that he sort of worked with. When we sort of took him out on deployment and he done that type of stuff, there was a passion that was instilled in him where he was sort of, I want to use all of my skill set that Allah has given me to be able to help the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu So he was able to take all of the skills that he has and redirect them. And I think with creatives, I think this is something huge. And I, I spoke to my cousin about this because he sort of, you know, does the, the creative element of things as well for, for other people. In terms of the, there's so many skills that Allah has given, you know, creatives themselves, that if they're able to channel, uh, channel it into a different direction, sure. into it going away from, okay, possibly just being about business and making money, of course they need to do business, they need to make money, they need to do all of that type of stuff. But if they can challenge it, challenge, uh, uh, channel it into a different direction, there's so much khair that can come from their hands. And I say this all the time to people who come out and record for us and this type of stuff, that you are the reason that the voices of these people are heard. Yeah. Without you, no one knows their stories. Without you, no one actually knows about their cause. Without you, no one actually hears that they require your support without you there is no money that comes in for the charity to be able to implement so you you in essence you know the creatives are almost the gatekeepers to, to some extent and i don't think i think now a lot of charitable organizations have realized that it took us a year to get to this stage to sort of realize okay creatives are the gatekeepers why because the creatives allow those stories to get out allow us to be able to get funds and in got great ways and then of telling support those people stories, yeah. absolutely and this is it and we don't want to do the beating a dead horse with the same video or the right. same type of thing over and over again because we want it to be engaging. And I know we're not trying to turn the plight of our brothers and sisters into entertainment. We're not trying to do that. But still at the same time, we need to do something that catches the attention of the people. Well, if you're, yeah, and if you're telling, I, I think as long as you're telling a real story of a real person, you're really trying to help that person. Yeah. Having their story told uh, in a way that's ethical and in a way that's transparent and in a way where a person it can connect to a person's heart, then it, it does encourage people to, um, give more and uh, be able to help them because we are people who 
you know, in, in, in some ways we need to connect to things, right? We're sociable characters. And equally, as you're um as you're kind of like hinting to, there is an element of as Muslims, uh, when we give a sadaqah, we should be giving a sadaqah and we should be um pure enough with it where we give it a sadaqah because we give it a sadaqah. You know, I mean, we uh, like the, I suppose there's a balance there, right? Uh, I like for, for example, what I'm getting guys. I, I remember speaking to one sheikh, right? And he said, um, he said, you know, somebody asked me once, like, how can I like become? How can I? How can I like almost like um, track specifically where my donation is going? Yeah. And he said, when you, he said, are you giving a sadaqah to see specifically where it's going, or are you giving a sadaqah for the sake of Allah, right? And um, and I think there's obviously like a balance between the two because like it's completely understandable that somebody would want to make sure that their money is going to where they want that yes. money to go to. Yes. But equally, also, uh, I think the sheikh had a point where he's basically saying like. Um, also, you know, give sadaqah. I, that, I, think, I don't I think know. There, there, there's a, th- a very thin line. Um, yeah, it's a tough uh, one, isn't it? It's yeah, a sensitive it, topic as well. It is a very, very sensitive topic. I think that the, the reality is this. Organizations need to be transparent to their donors. Correct. If an organization is transparent to their donors, their donors can ask whatever questions they want. Yeah. Their donors' questions are answered. Yeah. Their donors' questions, ninety percent of the time, should be answered even without them having to ask. Sahih. It should just be enough that they can go and read an annual report. They can go and look at the work. They can go on social media. They can go wherever they want to do their their research, and they're able to see what is happening with the money that they're giving. So yes, we should be transparent, and that is a given from the absolute beginning. All organisations who take an amana, who take a trust from the people, should be transparent in delivering their trust. Now, from an individual perspective. As a person, not as an organization. As a person, there is that notion of, I gave this money for Allah. He sees it, right? Yeah. Allah doesn't sleep. So I gave this money for Allah. Allah, he sees it. And Allah, he knows what my intent was behind this money. My reward is with Allah, not with the people. So that's from an individual You're perspective. Right. So if both people are doing their bit, it's a yes, perfect world. Exactly. It's so like if both what, do it, it's, it's perfect. It's like that analogy that we've given many times in the podcast, where it's like imperfect marriages when, you know, you know what Sheikh Tim, he often says, he says that you should. Um, uh, so now we're not talking about charity, right? But it reminded me of this thing. He said that you should be a person who wants to give somebody else all of their rights, but you're not expecting any of your rights. Yeah. And that works perfectly when, for example, in a marriage or in a brotherhood or uh, in any kind of relationship, both people are doing that. Then, because what's happening is both people are giving each other their rights. And naturally, they're receiving all of their rights, but they're not expecting their rights. Yeah, so it's when you prefer someone over yourself. Right, which is what we're taught, right? Yeah, so I prefer you in terms of you have the luxuries, or you have the benefits, or you have whatever ease that you need over myself. Why? Because my ease will come from providing you your ease. Yeah, and, and, and believing in that is amazing. Like, uh, but it's the hadith of the Prophet and, and just to, when we go off topic, uh, and just to go off the charity topic, and then we'll, we'll sort of come back to it. But the, the hadith of the Prophet and it applies to charity as much as it applies to, to everything else, is the Prophet says that Allah will continue to be at the aid of his slave as long as his slave continues to be at the aid of his brother. Yeah, this is This amazing. in itself is, we require, I require the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in running my home, in running my business, in taking care of my children, in educating my children, Sorry. in every element of my life. There is nothing within my life that I do not require the aid of Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I require in everything, from the beginning to the end. The only way for me to achieve this aid is to go and help someone else. Yeah. Now, whether that's within a charitable perspective and, and that realm, or whether that's the kindness that we spoke about uh, with the Light Upon Light tour and mine and your interaction, yeah, yeah, yeah. helping you helped me. Sir. You know, being kind to you was me allowing or me opening the, the door uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to be kind to me. So, hey. so for me, whatever I gave to you was only because I wanted it back, uh-huh. right? And, the only, and I don't want it back from you. Why? Because you don't have control of giving me Sahih. what my heart needs. You Sahih. don't have control of, of giving me that comfort. Yes, in a worldly perspective, okay, maybe you, you could give me something. But in terms of that comfort and that need and for that to be fulfilled, that only comes from the one who's in control of the heavens and yeah, the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I give to you to receive back from him. So there is someone I want to receive back from, but it's not you. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, um, first of all, that chicken at that restaurant... When I had to decline it that day, the first day of food poisoning, that's what you, when you spoke about being ill again. 
I was so sad about missing like that. <laughs> you know, with the sauce. It was sad to watch oh. you just eating chips. I think you were just eating chips, or was it just bread? No, I tried to eat just the chips, but even that I couldn't even have. But you know, I was looking at your face, and I was looking at you, I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying this meal a little bit too much for for Faisal to to not be enjoying nah, it at all. I wasn't even hungry, but I was just. It looked so good, and I was hungry, but I knew I couldn't have it. Something like that. Oh, anyway, sorry, I just reminded me of that. Yeah, that hadith is powerful, bro. Like, it, it, uh, even another principle I had recently was that if you like, if you if you truly love somebody um, you give from what you love yes oh, that's amazing man yes. because like that hurts you know give until it hurts I guess right Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it with the the muhajireen and the ansar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about when the muhajireen entered uh, into Medina that the ansar gave from half of their wealth some of them yeah. gave half of their wealth to their brothers and at that point Allah talks about the fact that they gave when they were the ones still in need subhanallah you know, they were the ones still in need, but they gave to their brothers Allah instead. Allah. You know, so so with this, th this is that that high, uh, that extremely high level of reliance and tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, that from a worldly perspective, I think I need what's in my pocket right now. But if I give it to Faisal and it's gone from my pocket, who was the one who put it in my pocket to begin with? Allah. So, Does Allah's dominion become less because yeah, I gave it to Faisal? He's al ghani Allah is the one who is rich. So if Allah is always easy to replenish what, what I've already given away, and the Prophet Sallallahu teaches us that sadaqah doesn't decrease your wealth, but not from a charity perspective, but from a human perspective, so. just from kindness to people, just from wanting to help people, just from wanting to, to give a good word to someone. You do all of that, why? Because at the end of it, if you're doing it to non-Muslims, it's a good form of da'wah through no. your actions. No. If you're doing it to your brothers, it's because Allah commanded you to be good to your brothers. So. And to your sisters, and later that is all going to be repaid to you exactly, he's in the, the next just. life to come because Allah yeah. is the most just. Sahih. Powerful man. I'm going to get the game. You're going to get the game. You know, no. the only time I've played the game is with my wife. I played it with my wife, just me and my wife. Okay. And I also played it with my children. Okay. Uh, with my children, it was quite funny. Um, with my wife, it was, yeah, it was very, very deep. Uh, and, and the game itself, mashallah, I'm. Uh, I think everyone should go and purchase the game. I'm not being khair. told. By the way, I'm not being told to <laughs> say this, and, and I haven't been uh, yeah, yeah. been told prior. But I, <laughs> I, I think honestly, on a, on a on an honest level, I think I think yeah, the game yeah, is yeah, excellent, yeah. and uh, I think people should go out, uh, should purchase just as a, a game of communication. <laughs> that means a lot. Uh, uh, now bro, that bro. the plug's done, yeah, you know, no. I'll uh, accept some payment. Yeah, later. exactly, exactly, <laughs> um, bro. So uh, I haven't actually played the game on on air in a very long time. I don't know why. I don't know how much of it you're gonna to have to cut out if I start crying and all the rest of it. Oh, but that'd uh, be good. That'd be good. That would be good footage. Yeah. But I think it's a good transition. Let's hope not. Um, so we'll round out the podcast with this. Okay. So what I'll do is I never know how to play the game um, on the podcast. To be honest, I mm -hmm. think the best way of doing it is splitting the deck, and then we can have like some questions at each. So I'll try and I'll see. That's half the deck. So you take those questions. Mm -hmm. I'll take these, and I'll begin. It took, it, to be honest, it makes sense for us to just play like asking you because you're the interviewee, but uh, we'll have a... Okay, I'm going to start, okay? Yeah, go on. I don't know whether to... Uh, how should we do it? Should we pick and choose the questions or should we just pick them randomly? Up to you. Um, uh, random is fun. I'm open. Okay, let's go random. We might have to... You might pick one and I might say, can we skip? But I'm open fine, to... We'll go random, we'll go, go random. On. Uh, what is one repeating problem you can automate or eliminate today? One repeating problem that you can either automate or eliminate today. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, better time management. If I could give myself a better routine. You were bang on time today. Time management for that was good, but yeah. time management in different elements of my life, in terms of my work life, in terms of the charity life, in terms of my family life, I think I'm still struggling with Iman Relief being so new, with it only being sort of a year and a half um, as a not-for-profit and then a year as a charity. I think I'm struggling with giving everyone their right within uh, within their times. How can you automate that? I think I need to put a, a full full on schedule yeah, in place. Yeah, I agree. A um, yeah, a full on schedule in place and live by that schedule. Sahih. But I, I think that the problem is with, with charity work, you're always 
emotionally driven. Sah. So something becomes extremely important yeah. every time you put yeah, it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's trying to find the, the wow. balance of that. And then everything else falls to the bottom of the list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And to be honest, and, and this is where you know my, my wife and my children get a shout out. Um, I am extremely grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave me the partner that I have. Um, and he gave me the children that I have. My wife is extremely, and I saw Hamza Tortis speak about his wife, yeah. um, and I felt him. Yeah, yeah, same I absolutely yeah, yeah, felt yeah, yeah, everything yeah. that he said. My wife has been extremely, extremely um, supportive, extremely understanding, extremely uh, motivating with everything that I've done in my life. I got married very, very young. How old were you? 18 Ah you told me Yeah, I yeah so yeah, I, yeah. I got married very very young And I, I say this all the time I say that my My mum raised me My wife turned me into a man yeah. My wife went on that journey with me Of development Of turning into a man And, and these type of things And she's always been Extremely extremely supportive uh, So even now You know when, when The charity work comes in And life and responsibilities And business and other things are there It tends to be her that takes you know, the, 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 the loss in terms of time so, But she's always been supportive, continue Because yeah. she sees the long-term vision well, And my children amazing, as well man, yeah. Absolutely I, I, I give all of my success to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Whether within my personal life Or whether, you know, as an organization or whatever To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Before anyone else And thereafter, the next person is my wife And then my children, alhamdulillah You know, now my sons are getting a bit older They need more time with me um, But they again are very understanding And I'm trying to pull them Within the, the processes of everything so, so that they, they feel like that's something we're doing collectively but but if, yeah. if, if you're on the next uh, tour If we if we get booked again which I don't yes. know if I will, No, no, you uh, will, you <laughs> will. You the, will. Uh, Bring your sons, it'd be nice I will, absolutely They wanted to come the, the first time But with me the first time I was still trying so, to yeah, yeah, understand yeah. the processes of course, of course, um, of course. But I definitely will bring them I actually want to take them out on deployment and stuff But they're, they're a little bit young They're now in secondary school So my oldest is going to be 13 okay. and, and my other son's going to be 12 Um but I'm just giving them a couple of years more um, Because I think emotionally deployments are very very yeah, difficult yeah, yeah, yeah. But events and these type of things then, then definitely I want to get them out And my girls But they, they still have some time to, to get older inshallah So now for you Faisal Would you say that you're the same person in private as you are in public? Oh, that's a great question for somebody who has a, such a life in public isn't it? Yes uh, I would say yes uh, because hopefully I would like to hope so of course, everybody has a level of themselves that is, that is only themselves in private, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, at home, I'm like, um, like you know, like uh, I believe Umar ibn Khattab said, like you be a, be like a child in your home, you know. Yes. And so I'm kind of a bit more like that. I'm like dancing around and all sorts. Like, um, so there's a level I think that of course nobody is themselves in private and public. But if we put that aside, then I'd I would like to hope so. And I think that the podcast has helped with that because there's only uh, I, th I don't think there's a possible way for you to fit record, you know, must be around 500 hours of content we have of podcast uh, and still be someone else. Yeah, I have to be myself. And so uh, the questions that I ask are the questions that come into my mind. Podcast episodes are always unscripted. Uh, the reactions I have are always my reactions and stuff like that. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to think so. Yeah, I think, you know, just to touch on your question, um, I was having this discussion actually with my wife and my, my sister-in-law and we were actually talking about people changing faces. Um, and then we were saying, okay, with people changing faces in terms of one face at home, one face outside, et cetera, et cetera. I said that happens and there are people who do that. But I think sometimes there's people who change hats. Right. So it's not the face. You change the role yeah. or the hat to fit the environment that you're oh, in, but you don't analogy. change the face. That's amazing. Analogy. The face is still the same. It's still the same person. So he, but you've just changed... Um, your setting or your Correct. language or, or the way that you behave to be able to accommodate the environment that you're in, and, that's, and that's, I don't that's, think that's there's wisdom. a problem with that's that. Wisdom, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's a problem with that. So there's no issue with changing hats. There's an issue with changing faces. Yeah, that's an amazing analogy. Yeah, I, I rate that. I think that, I, I think that's true. I think people should be like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, this is Shazad. Thank you so much. Uh, for your time. No, thank you, Faisal. You know, Jazakumullah khaira for having me uh, on the episode. I think. It's very, very important, you know, especially for, for me and for organizations on a whole to be able to come on podcasts like this, to be able to talk, you know, about the realities of our organizations, about ourselves and these type of things. And people like you who allow that to happen are a gateway 
uh, to the people itself, and and we're truly grateful. Well, we're, you know, that, we're, we're truly I, grateful. I, I don't think that necessarily is true. And I, 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 we spoke extensively, you know, throughout the tour about Iman relief, and I was just amazed by it. Um, and there's so, always something about homegrown uh, organizations that um, you feel like you know the people and stuff like that. That kind of is amazing, and you know, I had the same feeling with Spot. As well, and so uh, inshallah, it'll be it'll be good if uh, inshallah the viewers can go over to our Instagram, see some yes. of the new campaigns and stuff that we're running, see how you they guys can are going to be pushing a lot of stuff during Ramadan. Yeah, right? Ramadan's uh, we're now in the busiest period of the year. We're in the busiest period of the year. We've got lots and lots of projects coming up. One of our big projects this year, inshallah, is going to be emergency homes for Syria. Okay. Last year, alhamdulillah, we built seventy homes in Syria, uh, which was actually the village itself is opening this March. Sorry. I'm actually meant to travel to Syria, still waiting on, on paperwork and permission uh, to travel and to actually open and. and great the village itself um, but this year we want to build more homes we want to build more homes and, and take the families out of the difficulties that they're in and if people sort of come over sort of have a look at the work that we're doing see the volunteering opportunities deployment opportunities the creatives as we spoke about if they get in touch drop us a message we're accessible and for us we're still at that stage as an organization where it's a small group of seven yeah um, so with us it's really really easy now if people want to join and and come in and support where we need all of that support yeah um, so yeah, Jazakumullah khaira for, oh, yeah. for having me, bro. And uh, ask Allah to put barakah in your life. I mean, I mean. Ask Allah to put barakah in your children. Ask Allah I mean. to put barakah in everything that you do. Is and uh, generally all organizations and you know people who are working for the betterment of the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we ask Allah to bless them, to put I mean, barakah in their, mean. their efforts and, and to accept from them and to give us the capacity to continue to do more. I mean, Jazakallah khaira. Khaira. amazing. Thank you so much. Khaira. Khaira. You have to come back. Inshallah, okay, so inshallah, inshallah. Don't be shy. Jazakum I know it was hard khaira. to get you on yeah, here it already. So inshallah, you're not a very public point. guy. So it's nice. Uh, yeah, I'd love to have more conversation, more conversations with you in the morning. Jazakumullah khairan. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.